It's your second hour in the liberal sandbox, and you're head on with Bob Kincaid. Coming up on six minutes past, I'm all better now. No, I'm not, but I'll pretend. I'm Bob Kincaid. This is Head On for a Wednesday night. It's a prayer meeting here. And uh, we're joined on the phone at this point in time uh, by a, who I, a man who I hope will become a new friend of the program, Joe Badgent, uh, author of the upcoming text, Deer Hunting with Jesus. Um, and I, I don't know how to even begin to describe something with a title like that, Joe, but welcome to the program. I'm so glad to uh, make your acquaintance. Well, thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. And when I heard it was coming from West Virginia, I said, "I'm doing that one." That's my people. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you, you you decided to because yeah, it's it's your folks and uh, your folks are my folks, and we're all a bunch of crazy Scots Irish, and we're just trying to get over it. Well, we're also the hardest working people in America, and you need to get start getting a little respect for it. Well, there's the, the, there's there is that as well. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I first became aware of your writing. Uh, when one of our listeners over in the uh, the, the chat room, uh, a gentleman who goes by the name of Cossack, uh, sent me a, a, a dispatch you had written from the Belizean coast. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I must admit I was freezing my butt off here and, and, and was <laughs> filled, filled with just abject jealousy. Uh, but your observations, uh, especially of, uh, what, Redneck America, of, of which we are a proud part, um, yeah, I'm not ashamed of the name. No, uh, you know we can fix we can fix broken cars and 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 make uh, 70 year old houses uh, work out just fine and 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 uh, we we're, we're we're amazing folks, but we have been led astray, have we not? Well, I think so. I mean, uh, I think we've been uh, manipulated uh, politically. You know, it's not anything that new. Except uh, I do believe that the current administration and and the last couple waves of Republicans understood a couple things like everybody says all oh, the republicans were so organized at the grassroots level you hear that from the liberals a lot no they had sense enough to collect church lists nobody had ever done that <laughs> you know what i mean yeah that sort of thing it was a little sleazy but you know yeah oh a little <laughs> voter caging and all that but but uh, you know i mean I, my brother is a fundamentalist preacher over in martinsburg west virginia it's oh dear me church over there and um and i could tell by watching they were flattered to get the political attention in the first place. In the second place, most people really didn't understand the separation between church and state. Well, they're, uh, in, in, that, in that particular uh, arena, they're frequently told that it doesn't exist, that it's a misnomer, that it's just a, a handy little phrase that was taken from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, sort of um, uh, regenerated by Hugo Black, and that, you know, yeah, no, this is not, it's not really real. There's no separation. Yeah, there. yeah, I try not to, you know, in the book, what I tried to do is come meet, come meet my people and then see what you think, you know. And, of course, you know, being who I am, I can't keep my mouth shut in between. I got some opinions, too. <laughs> right. But uh, a lot of it, you know, somebody asked, asked me the other day, um, you know, are, are are working people doing a- anything to help America? I said, no, America's got to do something to help working people. They've been neglected, you know, and if you if you feel like they're ignorant or you feel like they're ill-informed, you know, then it's your America too. You know, and and, and there's a do and and I don't mean any elitism by this, Joe, uh, but it's somewhere along the way somebody and, and obviously you're doing it. We're trying to do it. Uh, has has an obligation to try to get some of the information out there to try to counter some of the ignorance. Uh, and, and and it's not it's not willful ignorance. Uh, whether it's the media or or what's being passed down from the pulpit, uh, there's a big con job going on, isn't there? I think so, but uh, there always has been. It's just been effective lately. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but what you know, uh, whether it's uh, I mean uh, we we've had the discussions about Ill- immigration and things like that, and and I pointed out at one point you know all these uh, it, it's one thing to have uh, uh, an illegal so-called illegal immigration problem in a, in a state that borders Mexico, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, why do you have an illegal immigration problem in North Carolina or in my hometown right here? The town proper itself is 26,000 people. We've got 4,000 illegal aliens live here, uh, almost all from Mexico, El Salvador, and so on. And that's the way that people that run the high end of business and industry around here like it. It's 
no darned accident. No, and it, it has it has to do with uh, what yeah, 10, 15 was, years well, ago. My daddy's labor going down another dollar an hour if he were still alive. Well, that's the truth, Wages Joe. Never been lower here in, compared to buying power. And tw- what 15, 20 years ago, there were there were right wing or Republican con- so called conservative legislators howling about uh, something called right to work. Yep. Well, now, I mean, my state's partly famous for the Bird Machine, who invented the right to work law, Senator Harry Flood Bird. You know, right. And, uh, he actually started really early. This, we're looking at 30 stuff because he wanted to labor here cheap to pick apple. He, they, here they grew a lot of apples then yeah. on what could only be called apple plantations. And if they could keep everybody begging for a job, then he made more money on his apple. That's and darn his, straight. His, his son was a senator, and uh, I don't. I don't think political talent is necessarily hereditary. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And they and they have, of course. The right to work law has just become so institutional right now that. And it's right to work in Virginia, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, everywhere that you see this influx of uh, south of the border cheap labor, uh, just curiously happens to be a place that has a, 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 a an entrenched right to work culture. Well, absolutely, uh, it's a sacred thing here. Even working men, see that? I mean, that was one of the earliest misnamings of a law. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, no child left behind and that sort of thing. But I, I was taking a friend here. He's from Russia and uh, he's been, or he's American, but he's been in Russia for quite a while teaching. And uh, we drove down the street. Uh, I, gr- you know, I grew up here and partly over the West Virginia line on my grandparents' farm. We go back there every time my family would get too broke. And I drove down the street. And our town is 66 percent rentals now, all owned by about 12 people. It's a town with 10,000 residential buildings in it. Um, and I drove down the street, two of the old streets we lived on. They were never good anyway. It was the place where white met black at the edges, you know, right mm-hmm. down the seam down through town. And the people living in those houses, of course, many of them are dead and so on, used to own those houses. Not anymore. And they bought them working at the mill. And, you know, and sad. It's really sad. Yeah, welcome, welcome to the Bush economic miracle. That's right. That's right. Uh, and and it's uh, yeah, it's an ownership society. But <laughs> well, we've had one of those before, Joe. We've had one of those before, and there was a little little dust up back in 1860 fought over the ownership society. Yeah, that's um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a lack of information here. It's also, uh, and I, I I've, I've been around this country enough to see it. it <laughs> My friend tells me it's now happening in Russia. <laughs> but, um, you know, the belief in here's these cheap Walmart goods. People feel like they're doing better than their daddy did because they got some new cheap slave labor clothes made in China and they got a new truck to two payments behind them. That was assembled in Mexico. Yeah, you know. And they say, oh, we're doing better. You know, what? You know, because you got more debt than, than the last four generations of your family ever had. You know, no job security, no health care, and a few cheap trinkets and doodads and electronic junk. Well, the snow job worked pretty well. Yeah, it's it, it's worked very well. What uh, you know, the uh, the essay that you wrote or uh, that uh, uh, prompted me to contact you was uh, redneck liberation theology. Oh, that yeah. And in which uh, you, you describe, among other things, your neighbor down the you know the, the neighbor down the road. Uh, who thought he was doing okay, and everybody everybody noticed the foreclosure notice published in the legal ad yeah. section of the newspaper, and you sort of you know, oh gee, that's tough, and you don't say so much about it. But that's that's big. That's you know, we, we're going from the American dream to the American nightmare. nightmare oh, yeah, are we two not? pages of them these days <laughs> of those boxes. Now, when I say you know, I, I don't want. Uh, I always worry a little bit when people refer to the stuff I write from belief. Um, a, a few years ago, well, it was, I finally just started acting on it about two years ago. I'm 60 years old, you know, and I, I wanted to do better than I have done. I always joke, tell my wife, you know, I felt the devil's hairy hand around my ankle. I'm going to clean my act up and be a better world citizen. So I went down to Belize and found a village there. And for $3,000, you can build a man a home, you know. For $500, you can put a working woman in the restaurant business. You know, for a thousand dollars, you can you can start a, a man in a construction company. These Garifuna people—they're black fishermen, and they're the underdogs of their nation. So, uh, I 
always try to make it clear that I don't go down there to lay in the sun. <laughs> you know, this this fat old guy. <laughs> it's, it's, well, I don't, yeah, I don't think anybody could hold it and, against and you. And if the proceeds from the book are all go entirely there. I live on four thousand dollars a year because I'm trying to talk and walk my talk. You know, and it's possible. Well, it bless possible your you know bless your heart better. for it. I, uh, I you know I, I admit I uh, I was reading the article and I uh, I put on a Jimmy Buffett song, uh, but I <laughs> I don't I don't I don't think there's a crime in that. Uh, and uh, well, all I was saying is that, is that um, you can go and make the world a better place. And everybody says, why didn't you go down to New Orleans? Because what goes down in New Orleans is a, a racket, and a man with ten or fifteen thousand dollars couldn't help America. You know, well, we yeah. can, but there's another way to do it. You know, right. it's political. Right. But you know, you but also while you were in Belize, Joe, you I think you were able to put some. Oh boy, I'm going to sound like a, a real granola eater now. You put some psychic space between you and the and and the stuff that you like to observe. Well, the stuff that matters. That to you. Granola. I'm an old hippie too. Okay. And I left this town. I joined the Navy. Lied about my age. I was 15 and a half years old and went off to the Vietnam era just to get away. And I thought it was opportunity in my eyes, you know, but it was getting out of a small town. And when I got back, uh, then I went through <laughs> sort of a hippie stage, which I'm proud of. You know, I learned I learned about a little bit about being free. I think we need something back then that a lot of people don't know now. But it, it's it's made me on the left side of the political scale for the rest of my life. Well, I, I don't I don't see I don't see how it could help but because you um you you stepped to the outside and you looked back in and I think you're continuing to do that. At least that's what I'm getting from uh from from the essays that you write. Even even sitting there where you are, there's well, a little. I'm, I, I'm in Virginia right now. Right, so that's what I mean. You, uh, even sitting there where you are, there's still a little aspect of. You know, you didn't get conned. You didn't get sucked in. You didn't. You didn't buy the hokum. You didn't. Uh, you didn't drink the Kool Aid or rub the snake oil on. I did for a while. I did for uh, oh, fifteen years. See, I mean, I was the guy that quit high school, right, and mm-hmm. got a GED in the Navy. And when I got out, by the time I was twenty, I was married and I had a sixteen-year-old wife. And by the time I was twenty-one, I had a kid. And my first experience with college was to get the two hundred and ten dollars a month on the GI Bill, and then the whole world opened up. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and and again, the GI Bill is not what it was. No, um, no, it's a it's a come on. It's a it's it's a carney it's a carney's card uh, card trick now. Oh, I know. Do you think Lindy Ingram was ever really going to go to college? I, I know. I don't know if you've hit that chapter yet where she talks. You know, but uh, uh, you know if. You know, if you if if you never had a book in your house growing up, you know, and your daddy was a truck driver and your mama was a waitress, and you spent your time watching American Idol, there I don't care how much you're in the army, you're not going to walk out of there and go to a university, probably not. That's the odds. And the big lie that anybody can become president, not when you're in a white culture. My argument in the book is much of white culture is ghettoized too. We just don't uh, prefer yeah, not. Well, the difference is we don't wear the baggy shorts and the bling and the chain around our neck. We got a truck and a gun, but it's the same ghettoization. If you can't see outside the box that you're trapped in. Yeah, and if uh, uh, if the most you can hope for is to maybe tread water and stay even with uh, uh, with with mama and daddy, uh, that's that, well, that's a, that's that's a, an abnegation of the American dream, isn't it, Joe? I, well, I think so. I mean, I think every American probably had a different dream, but there was some commonalities that appealed to the whole darn world, and one of them was owning your own home. That was a pretty darn hard thing to do in the, in the 18th century when this country was founded. I mean, an idea of boundless land and uh, some yeoman sense of freedom, which I personally believe a warrior, as the Scots-Irish are, they did understand that certain surly aspects of freedom you know that that are that are very good. Uh, Jim Webb writes about it in his book. You know, then uh, uh, those things are, are all gone. I mean, a man's yeah. home is his castle. Uh, the, my friend from Russia said, you know, in the city he lives in, one million people, every single person owns their home outright and has a DACA in the country, and they're bitching because they're not as rich as Americans. <laughs> <laughs> they're watching too much TV, Joe. <laughs> Well, he said they don't get it, you know, that, that, that all this stuff has been taken away from working people who are at least 60% of the population. 
and then I could make a good argument for seventy. So uh, let me let me ask then, Joe. Um, you know, you the the, the this uh, particular essay title, uh, Redneck Liberation Theology. Uh, why are leftists so damn afraid of God? Uh, this is you know this is our prayer meeting edition. Uh, Wednesday nights is prayer meeting here at Head On. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I, I have to ask you: uh, Is um, is part? Uh, do you see it as being part of uh, any sort of liberal or progressive outreach to the working South? Uh, does does it have to clothe itself in the mantle of religion uh, in similar fashion to what the right wing religion industry has already done? Well, um, I don't think urban liberals. I mean, what we have going on. Is it's almost urban versus rural in its cosmology. My my editor, my publicist, and you know, I mean, I'm a redneck boy. I never thought I'd have a damn publicist. <laughs> An editor. They all grew up, you know, urbanites in New York, and they're strong liberals, and they're great Democrats. And I don't think they can do outreach. I don't think they understand us enough. I think we have to be. Uh, I'm. I'm doing a new one about trench liberals, you know, and uh, left necks. There are people that can come from our own people. I've sent in enough bars and churches around here to know that we've got plenty of darn smart people that can speak the language, you know. Yeah. And I personally have, have talked to hundreds and convinced them. Not, usually not, but I mean, you know, over the years. And we're not incapable of getting the point. But it's, I just don't think it's going to be like it used to be where... Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the the person that has a certain kind of urban liberal education and background, it's not going to be able to say it the right way, you know. And then when I say, why are leftists afraid of God, that's more a symbolic way of saying it. You know, well, they, they, you know, there is a spiritual self, and most of all, there's mortal, moral self. That's what the next book is, is about. And it's... Uh, it's sort of about redneck liberation in a way, except it's about the Americans starting to find um, the moral center they lost. You know, and uh, I don't know what to say beyond that. You know, I think mm-hmm. people should not be afraid of morality, and they should not be afraid of spirituality, and they should not be afraid of brotherhood. And those things are not the exclusive pro- you know, property of Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson or the Republican Party. No, we were talking, We, you know, me and that mouse in my pocket. Uh, I was talking last night with a gentleman from Media Matters for America, and we, we sort of verged on, on, onto that topic insofar as um, we don't necessarily, you know, the, 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 that, that, that survey that was done after the 2004 presidential election and the media made such a hoo, uh, hoo-ha out of it, where uh, people said, you know, moral values were the reason that they voted for George Bush. Well, you know, uh, moral values are also whether or not uh, your neighbor gets to keep his house or whether the guy comes with the rollback in the middle of the night and takes away his truck because he can't make enough money to take care of his family. Those are moral issues as well. And uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a, there's a reason that uh, John Kerry never had a prayer south never of the Mason-Dixon line. Neither is Hillary Clinton. No, she doesn't. But all the people up there... <laughs> That's the publishing company are thinking hell. Well, Hillary's going to fix it all. Uh, well, I, I, I don't see it because I don't. I don't see. You know, I, I, I you know. I said you couldn't have picked a more disliked, disliked woman in America by, by and large when it comes to voting. Yeah, and that's not to say no woman can win. No, not at all. It's that woman can't win. That woman can't win because she's perceived as ambitious, as cold. And, and, and they tell uh, let's she's not. Uppity, well, you better up, show people. Yeah, let's not forget Uppity, Joe. She's and Uppity. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's, <laughs> this that's, is a good show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and, and you know, the same thing with John Kerry. You know, he came to West Virginia, and we stood out in the hot sun at the airport in Beckley, and he came out and he talked to us about what America needs. Yeah. And a little bit later, he showed up at a rally uh, on Labor Day where the UMWA gave him a hunting rifle. Yeah, I saw that. And he was about as believable uh, w- with that hunting rifle in his hand, whether or not he hunted every day of his life. It didn't. It, it didn't. It didn't work. No, it didn't speak. I, I didn't it, want to vote for Fred Munster. No. You know he wasn't believable at all. But but even beyond that, you know the. You know I don't really. 
I, I really don't much like, and you know, I'm, I'm so far left. I got to send up smoke signals to say hello to the Communist Party. So I don't know what the <laughs> hell you say, you know. But I don't like um, the easy explanations like uh, framing and all that. But there is some truth. The culture wars. There ain't any culture wars. It's just people, you know. And uh, and and when 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 the the, the liberal, the educated liberal mind, and I guess I'm an educated liberal, sort of, you know. And it, I'm incorrigible, but I tried. You know? Yeah. But the thing is, is they love the terminology. And so we hear about culture wars. Yes, you can define it that way. And that's nice. And it's nice for the university crowd to talk about. And when I read about it, I'm fascinated. But it's not going to say hello to your brothers down here. No, and, and, and there's a... You can't you can't be afraid and and see that's that's the that's, that's why I got in touch with you Joe I, I felt like you and I were uh, 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 sort of uh, resonating on the same at, at the same rate on the same string brothers under the skin exactly um, you you can't be you can't be afraid uh, to 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 walk into a, walk into a bar and you can't walk in there going <coughs> oh my God they still allow smoking in this state oh right right um, <laughs> Uh, you, you can't, you can't be, and, and you can't be afraid to know a little bit of Bible, uh, and and it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt us. Uh, you know, at the same time, they talk about culture wars. They won't acknowledge that the Bible then is part of the American culture. Sure, it you is. Have it both ways. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So, you know, I think it seems to me, Joe, that you are. Taking the fight where the fight's got to go, and that's kind of, and that's a lot of what we're trying to do here. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got a host on this network in Florida. We've got a host on this network uh, in uh, two of us in West Virginia, um, uh, and 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 more, you know, more coming, more growing all the time. And we we find, uh, I get emails from people saying, "My God, it's so nice to hear uh, somebody coming from the South who's talking liberal common sense." Uh, so you know, I think I think there's a place for it, Joe, and I think I think you're Especially doing something really important. You oh, know, I, I'm, I'm getting more out of West Virginia. In fact, my oldest son, he's 39 years old, and he just, uh, I mean, he grew up. You know, I, I moved around a lot when I was young, looking for work and stuff, with a wife and kid, learning to be a writer and all that. He moved back. I mean, he moved over to West Virginia, and he's happy. He says, you know, you won't believe what's starting to happen in this state. You know, it's just somebody's got to say it out loud in the South, and he's right. Yeah. You know, some, and you got to reach some people, like you say, you know, with a media network of its own. And but he said it's here, you know. And here and the, the, the biggest part the biggest part of it is letting is letting folks know that they're not alone. Right. Uh, because one of the one of the best tricks that the other side has done is to create this sense of the isolated liberal, uh, as if we were some sort of endangered species, like the snail darter. Yeah. Well, you know, too, uh, I always tell uh, people, you know, that when, when I'm dealing with people, you know, from northern urban areas or, or the West Coast, I lived out there for 14 years, and I loved it. And it's a good place to live in most cases. And the average person from the West Coast in California is no more zany and kooky and spacey than the stereotypes, you know, that we have of New Yorkers, you know. I mean, they, most people there work pretty darn hard for a living, but... The, the, but the stereotyping has just gotten entirely out of hand, and we and and we I feel like we allowed the Republicans to own all the words like values. If anybody's got a claim to values, it, it's at least the first half of the Democratic Party's history. Sure, it is. Uh, you know, uh, we let them claim those. The forty-hour work time. week. There's, those, that's a human value. The forty-hour work week because that that, that, that enables things like uh, family togetherness, uh, uh, family cohesiveness. Um, the, the, the child labor laws, you know, yeah. we were responsible for that too, Joe. But see, you know, they just claimed the word without defining it. And uh, anyway, well, I, I got, they say, why do the people go to the church? So, go to church so much there? You know, church attendance now is no higher than it was in 1820. One third of Americans have always been pretty darn religious. You know, you know how many born again presidents we've had. But the difference is that, to me, when I looked around in my hometown when I came back is the institutions, when they looked around at the institutions, public and social and uh, civic, what door was open to them? The church. Sure. They could take their kids. There was bingo night. There was camps. There was marriage counseling. You know, uh, uh, what community was left? The church. You know, and there they could be among their own kind of people. 
But if, one of the big lies is that they're homogenous. They're not homo- homogeneous. You know, if, if I go to a big praise temple here, you got two or three guys that run it, and they're politically active. You got about eight or nine elders. Uh, the inner church, a friend of mine, uh, a minister friend of mine, calls it, that are activists. You got the front row that are the main fans. But you get back in that back third, and they haven't even been baptized. No, they're there. They're there just to, to to be reminded. I think, Joe, that they are not utterly isolated in this world. And it's traditional. You see what I mean? Yeah. No. Well, here's one good thing: it can't. And when you raise a kid, you have to expose them uh, to the church. But if you sit back there and you get to know them, you find out that one third of this great body of people that everybody is painting as being totally homogeneous is not at all homogeneous. You know, yeah. And those are the guys you talk to. Well, exactly. Fred Clarkson, uh, Clarkson wrote one wrote uh, Eternal Hostility, and he was the first guy to start laying it out. You know about this battle between that, that political battle that was coming up, and he said the first thing you got to learn is who you can talk to. And that's that whole back half of the church. <laughs> back row Baptist. You well, know. Yeah, I mean, I, I describe myself to the world as a recovering Southern Baptist. <laughs> uh, but I know I know exactly what you're talking about there. Uh, I, I know I know those people, and I know you know what it's what it's like to move into a town where you don't know anybody. Yep. Well, you know, there's an again what you said. There's an open door at the church. You know, you can't just move into the neighborhood and and uh, uh, join the JCs or the Civitan. Right. Uh, but you can always you you can find a church because every one of them's got a welcome sinner sign sitting outside. Well, and the other thing, too, is it's a community of working people. Everybody's been convinced that they're middle class. And, and, and really, most of America is working class but doesn't know it because they sell job uh, instead of citizens. We're consumers now. And, for instance, if, you, if, you, if the man tells you well, how many hours you'll work, what you'll get paid, what benefits you get, how much sick leave you get, if any, when you can take your vacation off if any. and when you can be let go because he doesn't need you anymore, that's called working class. Yeah. And but the white but the guy in the white technician's uniform down at the hospital doesn't see himself as working class. No, he's a professional. And the woman wearing the fake costume jewelry at some boutique that's making eight bucks an hour doesn't see herself as working class. And even medical technicians and people who went you know, to to some degree of training. I mean, they don't think they're working class because they don't have a blue denim shirt on and walking out of a mine, wiping coal dust out of their eyes. Well, they got the world's changed. See, the traditional working class that people have in their mind, of course, it's a media image just like everything else. You know, those people walking that hospital floor at night, they better start seeing they, they are too. They're not middle class just because your car's shiny. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. Well, Joe, I tell you what, I've, I've really enjoyed our, our conversation. I know you're going to get awful busy here in, in, in a very short period of time, but I hope maybe somewhere along the way you can find time to come back and we can chat for, uh, chat some more. Well, I, I would th- love to because anything out of West Virginia that I'm a fan of, and excuse me if I rattle on. I, no, I love the rattling, man. I drank a little bit of coffee here. I said I'm getting worked up for this when we're talking. <laughs> we're talking in the great state of West Virginia. Well, I tell you what, any 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 time, I am serious. Any time that. Uh, uh, the uh, the burr gets under your saddle. Uh, uh, please please consider that uh, there's an open door and an open line for you here. Uh, I love I, I love the way you write. I love the way you think, and I think there's a whole lot uh, there's there's a whole lot more that need to hear what you're saying. I hope I hope they'll hear it uh, in, uh, in 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 the upcoming book. Uh, you know, well, th- you know, there's been some big surprises about that book because um, the reason I never wanted to even write a book. I mean. They called me. I didn't call them, and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, I, you know, I don't want to go through a divorce. I've watched a lot of writers do books. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but the thing of it was, they said, "Oh well, the market is the urban liberal." And uh, what is this? Guess, what is this, okay. is this a travel log you from know the? What? I get hundreds and hundreds of emails a week from people. You know, they uh, they they might be school teachers, they might be uh, supervisors at the plant, they might be this or that or the other. But the majority of emails I get are from people that do not have a college education. Only twenty percent of America gets a degree. 
And so in their high and mighty judgments about who the audience is going to be, the big shock has been there's a hell of a lot of people that still know how to think in this country. Sure. So I've been I've been absolutely deeply moved and, and humbled, you know, by the response that's come from, you know, people that are taking it up the shorts and say, "Yep, that's the truth." And and the, and and who have gotten their education the hard way, and maybe got none at all. I mean, there's yeah. so many self-educated people in this country. There's no acknowledgement of it. I had no idea that there were so many literate people, educated themselves, and working class families with a high school education. Sure. You know, and went on and, and read things and do things and think. I mean, well, I, I could, you know, there was. I wish a, I could show you my emails. Uh, I'd love to see them. There was a book that came out, uh, oh, I guess maybe a year or so ago, the title of which was Whistling Past Dixie. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. But the thesis of it, Joe, is that uh, uh, in order to build a Democratic majority in this country, Democrats need to forget about Alabama and Virginia and North Carolina and Tennessee and Kentucky. Just forget about them because, um, uh, because you know, that's high-hanging fruit and it's going to be too much work to yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, if we're and, and you know what, maybe he's right. If we're willing to just forego the no, the notion of a republic and one nation under God and uh, or or you know whatever you want to call it, uh, if we're willing to forego that and just and just balkanize an entire uh, an entire segment of the country and and uh, uh, cede that battleground uh, to the other side and say that those people aren't worth it, uh, then that guy's right. But if you're right and if I'm right, then that is where we take the fight. Yeah. Yep. You know, I'll tell you another thing too, and I, I don't want to drag it on too long here. All the time these, these you want. Values, Joe. These values that these people hold at core. If somebody wants to get down and talk about values, and I've done it in some gritty, darn venues, there are the the, the things of of a decent wage, you know, a decent opportunity in life, and so on. These values aren't just white and Scots Irish. The reason the book's getting so much publicity is because nobody thought white people could be oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. The big liberal myth that the white man is always the oppressor. Well, I'll tell you, when I talked to these Hispanics, I organized a renter's union, you know, because of what was going on here, no housing inspections, and all the things you get away with in the South. And I found out there, the, you know, the thread of common basic values is common to working black men, working white men, and new immigrants. You know, a chance, an opportunity, and a little bit of justice and security, and a, and a will and a willingness to work like a dog. Yeah, in exchange well, you know for just what? a little bit that of that. Used to be the values of the Democratic Party. Those three things. They could still have all those people. You know, before the Westchester Country Club decided it was better to get yuppies and four hundred one k's. Yeah, yeah. There's a, oh, there's, there's there's so much truth in that. I was uh, recently down in Alabama, Joe. That's where I was born and raised. All my family's from here. Um, my dad passed away a, a few months ago, and I'm trying to handle his estate and take care of his place. And uh, I went I went down there to look after a couple of things and pick up another truckload of stuff and bring it back. And within oh thirty forty five minutes of having pulled into the driveway. Um, uh, two different neighbors had come up and said, "You know, just wanted to let you know we're keeping an eye on the place while you're gone." Mm -hmm. And I can think I can think of a lot of places in the United States where that wouldn't happen. There's a lot of places in the United States now, Joe, where you can live uh, you can live 50 feet from somebody for 25 years and never know who they are. Yep. Uh, the day There's I a whole big band around D.C. is like that. Now I lived out in Eugene, Oregon, the same way. I lived 10 years in a house there. Met my neighbors on each side about four times. Yeah, before I left, uh, the 93-year-old neighbor lady brought me a sweet potato pie oh. to to you know to have on the way home. So hard. She she said, you know, I've seen you out there working so hard in the yard and cleaning up and everything. I wanted you to have something special. And by God, this wasn't any in, in it wasn't a sweet potato pie in any rich pie crust either. This had been rolled out, had a little bit of a little bit of fat in it, and had drops of ice cold water sprinkled in the flour, rolled out and put in a pan, and the filling put in it and baked for me. I I, I got tears God, in my eyes. I know you, brother. You do know the truth, don't you? Uh, and 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 and, and it, it, those people, uh, it, dad it, Joe. Those people are worth fighting for. Yeah. Absolutely. And bless her heart, this particular neighbor lady uh, uh, wouldn't, uh, I mean, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, deign to, 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 to set her foot in the same 
uh, tracks that a Democrat had walked in because she has, she has been hammered by a singular message that we have no values, that we're godless, that we're atheists, that, we're, uh, that, that, that we want to, that want to make, take uh, the, the in God we trust off well, the money. And, a real quick example of something. Yeah. That we know that, and I, really, I don't have a whole lot of faith that the Democratic Party is going to pull it out either, you know, but we are the liberalism is inclusiveness. If it's nothing else, it's inclusiveness. The divisiveness has, that has come with ethnic, ethnic and identity issues and sexual preferences and gender issues and all that work against us when here it was an election year, and what did they make a big issue? Gay marriage. Jesus Christ, let us all get free first. <laughs> well, let us. Yeah, let us. I mean, what kind of choice? Who would have made a choice like that? If you knew what, where America was. Well, and and but we got we got conned on that one too, Joe, married. because that was that was politically. Uh, that was a creature of the right. I mean, yeah, the memos are out there. You know, emphasize gay marriage. Emphasize. Uh, 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 the, the big rocks in courthouses and stuff like that. Uh, we've done we've done a lousy job of uh, of, of equating uh, of, of of letting them talk about uh, uh, gay rights when we should be talking about human rights. Exactly, and wages, and what we're going to do when the oil runs out. You know, yeah. it's it's kind of like my mother. I have an elderly mother in a nursing home, and uh, and she's from that. You know that previous generation, and we were talking about the stuff that was on TV. You know about gay marriage, and she says, "Well, honey, I ain't quite sure what they do. Now, might not be healthy, though, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, these are people who never even think about it. You know, but they but they wave it around like a bloody shirt. You know what I mean? She's yeah. never thought about gays in her life. Never met a communist either, but you know they're. Uh, there, there, are, there are people out there who are uh, just sure that uh, you know that, that, that people like you and me are trying to advocate for the workers' paradise. No, I'm, when we're not, we just. No, I'm, I'm saying a whole lot of bad stuff is coming down the road. The cheap oil fiesta is going to be over, you know. And then what are we going to do, man? If we're not pulling together now, what's going to happen? You know, when 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 all this cheap energy, they, they think the price of gas is bad. You know, and belief it's twelve dollars a gallon. But people don't. They ride bicycles, and uh, it's like your sweet tater pie. You know, the neighbors, I, I go away. I don't own the house there. I built the place there, put it on somebody else's property, and said, you rent it out, and if I come back, and I send them $100 a month, 12 months a year. Anyway, they look out for me, all my stuff. You know what I mean? My guitar and the things I've left down there. Nothing's going to happen. You know, they're neighbors. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to show in some of the next things that I'm writing, what real community felt like. And, and people like you and me, we still remember it. And if we don't... We if, may be the last generation if it keeps up. It could very well be. And if we don't rebuild it, when those times come that you are talking about, Joe, uh, uh, there is going to be hell to pay. Oh, I know. Uh, you know, the, the, we, we've, got, we've got to find our way back... Uh, to where neighbors talk, you know. Part of what we do here is dedicated. We call, it, you know, and I think we we earn our stripes. We call what we do here conversation radio. This isn't talk radio. This isn't host driven. This is about this is about dialogue. It's about process. Uh, it's about discussion. It's about looking for answers, and it's about sitting on a front porch and and and, and talking amongst yourselves till you can, you know, because you can solve a lot of problems that way. It's not just idle chatter. Uh, yeah, and not not a totally controlled conversation. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, I never thought I would be the fat old uncle sitting on the porch, running my mouth. This mad. I had an uncle had political opinions. Well, you know, I'm proud to be. I'm proud to be in his shadow. You know, and like you say, it is like a porch conversation. It can go where it goes. The person might be vehement and it might be relaxed. You know, but it sure beats the the silly managed promotion of most of this interview stuff. People, that, that people no, you're going to be doing some of that. I'm doing 200 basically scripted interviews. But, uh, yeah, where I, I know I, where the you get the little sheet with the yep. book that says here are the questions to ask Joe. And, well, I had to write the questions and the answers. Oh God! <laughs> and then I had to dumb them down twice. Oh Lordy, I tell you. And I, mean, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. You know, I signed a contract and I took a man's money, and so I did it. Yeah, sure you did. Well, but, yeah. Uh, I want I want this to work out for you. I want the message to get out there. 
Uh, if there's anything we can do to help beyond encouraging people to buy the book and, 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 and talk and know your neighbors, talk to the folks, uh, start an American dialogue because that, that, that seems to be where you're going to. If there's anything we can do to help, Joe, please consider it's, it's a, the same here. a new friend. It's the same here. If there's anything I can do. I mean, uh, they tell me that, um, I mean, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I had a couple touching moments here this last month. You know, when Studs Turkle wrote that blazing endorsement for it to put on the cover, yeah. you know, about the voice of, of our people, I was sitting there at the computer with tears in my eyes because there was a man who was described working in America all his life, and he was my hero. I mean, he's been my hero since I was 20 years old. And Mark Crispin Miller comes out and says, you write like an avenging angel. Yeah, well, you know, the, see, and, and you would understand. Each time something like that happens, uh, you know, I got, I'm seriously choked up because I never thought I would see something like this happen. And now, Random House is putting it up for a National Book Award. You know, Jiminy. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean it'll win it because I know what kinds of judges, but it doesn't matter. It's the idea of of of, of our journey from where we are, from where you are. I mean, it sounds like your background was much like mine. Coal you know, to come so far in America has been a gift. I mean, it has been a gift. I worked for every damn inch of it. But, but well, you can't throw it out. You can't throw out the opportunity. You know, the opportunity to be free and to speak and have dialogue, like you said, that porch, the American porch. Well, you know, when somebody like Howard Zinn says that you evoke working class America like no one else, uh, that, that, would, that would bring tears to my eyes. It did. It did. You know, and. Sherman Alexi, uh, who wrote, uh, it's not so popular out here, but he won a National Book Award. I lived on an Indian reservation in Idaho. I built a cabin and I plowed with horses. I wanted to just escape America, right? So I did this for about seven years in northern Idaho. Sherman Alexi is a young, well, he's not so young, he's 50, but he felt young to me. And he lived up there on that reservation, and I didn't know it. And he wrote an endorsement for the book. And then he called me and he said, you know, I used to come in the bar, you tended, and drag my daddy out. You know, and mm-hmm. I remember, oh, my God, that's that's yeah. Mr. Alexi's son. And he said, it's the same America. It's the same America for Indians, and it's the same America for working poor white men. You know, he said, and I, he had been waiting for a white man, you know, to write about the oppression of working white people. And so once more, you know, I, uh, I was so damn emotional I mean my god this guy whose books I admire you know for telling the truth books like Reservation Blues and uh, Lone Ranger and Tonto Fist Fight in Heaven and what really did is he made it so soulfully real what reservation life was and then to find out that you had helped him carry his daddy out many nights see I didn't remember because it was so many years ago yeah that, that so these, these kind of things that have come accompanied in it have just shocked you when you come from a town like this you say, "Wow, what a large country! What a what a, what a journey being an American can be." What a yeah, what a large country! What a journey, and what a tiny, tiny place in many ways as well. Yeah, oh yeah, and yet it's tiny. Well, I tell I tell you what, uh, the, we could go on like this for the ne- uh, for the rest of the night. It, you know, but uh, I don't. I, I know you're, you're you're busy, and I know you keep at it. And uh, <laughs> those two hundred interviews you got coming up, man, that's that's going to take some starch. I mean, you'll you'll have some saddle sores when you're done with that, Joe. <laughs> But you know, I love I love this idea of uh, oh, what did I see here? Uh, yeah, um, bourbon fueled prose. <laughs> it's a long tradition. White hot bourbon fueled prose. Uh, I, I I can't imagine I can't imagine anybody writing that about something that was written by one of those guys at the Westchester Country Club you were talking about. <laughs> um, well, you know what, as Southerners. You know, we have a culture that came for an awful long time without any operas, without any movie, without any string quartets and all this, and telling a story was entertainment in a hell of a lot of cabin van plantation parlors. And your ability to tell a story, we have a story, Gene, you and me and and, and just about anybody I've ever met in West Virginia, you know, uh, because social acceptance was part, a part of it was based on a rural culture that you had to be able to tell a good story, and often you were your own victim in it for the humor's sake so that's been a lucky gift because coming from the south enables you to write to tell a story and just re- instead of just report facts uh, it, it, it's got to be interesting you know there's that old saying about uh, the english came and built a house the germans came and built a barn the scots came and built a still 
<laughs> uh, you know, you, there, there, there is there, there's a these things these things fall into place. And uh, again, I don't I don't know I don't know how much of uh, the urbane, sophisticated liberals uh, actually understand that. You know, the, 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 a trip to uh, a trip to East Aboga, Alabama, is uh, as as mystifying as a trip to the Congo. And I don't mean any racial overtones to that. I mean nope. uh, it's it's every bit as foreign. And uh, and uh, and to have somebody offer you the bottle with the with the with the cork out um, and, and and no glass. Yep. Yep. Uh, is 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 some is some level of heresy. But if you sit back and you take a swig, Joe, yeah, and you start to talking and you feel that burn in your belly, and and you, and you hear the way that that, that 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 board creaks under the under the rocker of the chair. <laughs> That's right. And you pick up the inherent rhythms, and you start talking about the real problems that face real working people. Then the next thing you know, uh, it's not gonna it's not it's gonna play a little bit more hollow the next time that 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 guy with the uh, the, the the perfectly manicured hands and the and the and the no hair out of place haircut comes on the TV and says I've got family values. Right. It's going to be a little harder you know, to run the con. Uh, John Edwards gets got I just saw he got fifty five thousand dollars for a speech on poverty. <laughs> God. I know. So, I mean, you know, it's some of us can. You read a line like that, and and how can that pass? Anybody, those two words, and that number, and that word in the same sentence in a newspaper, and nobody was shooting him down. <laughs> well, can I ask you one last hard question, sure. then, Joe? Uh, you mentioned John Edwards there, and we talked a little bit about Hillary. Do you have uh, a person who uh, is there? Is there a person on the Democratic side of what's going to happen in 2008 that has captured your fancy in any way? Oh yeah, yeah, lots of them, but nobody ever heard of him. Jim Webb's the only one anybody ever heard of. Oh man, uh, a lot of people don't like him, you know. For liberal, he's a little bit military, you know. Well, we come from a fighting line of people, and I, you know, I told him I didn't like your book. I think he emphasized the fighting too much. We got a lot of other good stuff about us, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, but you know, if we get along, and uh, but by golly, you know, when he understands the symbolism, you know, that wearing those boots, it's not just a stunt. He's got a son in Iraq. When a man tells the president off on television, you know, the guy says, "How's your son?" He'll, you'll be, he'll be doing a lot better when you get us out of Iraq. You know, yeah. I mean, the guy is uh, got that nice wild streak. I, you know, I really like him. Uh, there's many things I've done. I don't know what he'd be like as the president. I know he wouldn't be the most stupid warlike president we had, but we're not going to get at some, anybody that's going to have all the qualities. Well, know, what's yeah, compromise and agreement? But it's the first one I've ever seen. Him and a couple other people that are local ones, you know, that uh, that stand up and just say it. Well, we're in a profound state of frustration here. Uh, uh, the the folks that share their time uh, to hang out and listen to me prattle on, Joe. Uh, we're in a profound state of frustration because you know, Hillary doesn't look like it. Bless his heart, Barack Obama doesn't look like it. No. Uh, you'd like you'd like to say maybe John Edwards, but again, you know, there's a lot of off-putting stuff there. Yeah, see the thing too with John Edwards. I mean, I, I'm really lucky that a lot of people. I, I live now. I'm not. I'm only 85 miles from DC. It was the sticks when I was growing up here, and now it's the way excerpts or something. Yeah. And so they tell me things. You know, I mean, people you know that are in the government and so on. And the thing is that John Edwards has the right roots, but is suckered in by some yuppie thing. They said if you meet his people. You know, you're going to meet some people with Bible hair. <laughs> he's, <laughs> you know, he's been he's been consul he's been consulted, hasn't but he? But he's afraid for anybody to see it. And the other thing is, of course, he is a lawyer. That's, that's two strikes, right? <laughs> now, yeah. Seriously, though, they said that uh, the thing about John Edwards is that that um, he's pretty much sucked into the Westchester Country Club thing when he doesn't have to be. That but that if he privately, you know, he does get it. Well, I think he does, and 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 the lawyering that he has done, uh, Joe, to me indicates that he does. Yeah, that's um, what I'm saying. You know, they, they, the other side calls him an ambulance chaser, but you know, when a guy when a guy takes a case on of a child who literally got sucked down a drain hole, mm -hmm. you know, that's a guy fighting on the side of the angels, yeah, as far that's as I'm what they concerned. Say, and they say he's, he's a, that the the uh, image stuff is that bowls him over too much. You know, the, the, I mean, hell, look what it did, did to John Kerry when you let other people control you. I mean. Well, look what it did to Al Gore. I mean, here's a personal, uh, a completely personable human being yeah. who got imaged to death in 2000. Yeah. And and meanwhile, there's George Bush running around the country mispronouncing the entire language, and people think it's because he's a good old boy. It's not. It's because he's a moron. 
I know. Well, you know, any just about anybody they got could stand on their hands, and if it, uh, any Democrat and get elected and stand on their hands and not do any more damage and look pretty damn good to me. Well, uh, yeah, I, I I get some of that. I just wonder. If I'm, I'm only half joking. No, 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 no. I no. I understand. I understand what you're saying completely. Uh, you know, we've had Dennis Kucinich on this program, and why Dennis doesn't get more uh, get more attention from the populist uh, from the people who have a populist turn is is beyond me because. I know. He's, I mean, you know, he's my absolute favorite candidate. He consistently is, and I don't know what you do about it. You know? I don't either. I, I, I honestly, uh, honest to God, I don't. There were better answers in the debate coming from him. We, uh, I, I just about wept. I don't know if you watched that debate, that so-called debate, uh, where they asked him, uh, asked the rest of the field if any, anybody would join with him in his uh, bill of impeachment against Dick Cheney, and all those hands just hung there by their sides. And, and 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 Hillary looked at the looked at the moderator like well you know if looks could kill the poor dude would have gone away in a basket. Uh, it was it was grieving it was grieve us uh, to see that happen Joe because it, that that means that there's an entire field of political candidates on the Democratic side who are more obsessed with their their quest for personal power than any sort of dedication to a, 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 they are a class they are a political class the same as the old Communist Party had a political class they're there's one party in America, and it's called the Party of Business, and it has two sides: the Democrat side of the coin and the Republican side of the coin. So, do you just sit it out, Joe? No, I, no, I, I don't think so. But, but, I, but, what are you going to do? You, you know, I mean, you got to slap some people around, I guess. You know, I, I just don't know. I mean, because they've sold out the Democrats. You know, all we're offered is two parties. You know, and and you know, it's edged closer and closer to a more and more conservative. Values? I don't know. I mean, it, you know, if it's percentage is possible, I'll write him in. Yeah. But, you know, that, you know, John Edwards is not a bad man. No, and everybody's one sort of hand sitting hand back hand. saying, you know, well, Al Gore could do it. Al Gore could do it with one hand behind him. Because I think he's learned the lessons of the handlers. Yeah. There's not going to, you know, Bob Shrum is not going to run his campaign. Good. Uh, you know, and, and 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 speaking of books, that guy's got one. Well, out Jim, Ma- Jim Webb darn near didn't win in Virginia, and and you know this state is getting more and more liberal as as people move down from up north. And I had a friend; uh, he was um, he's the head of the Green Party here. Well, people are quite surprised to know there are Christian Greens. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they care about the environment. They're Christians and they're green, and we got them here, and they've got them in other states too. Well, everybody was kind of shocked. But anyway, if it, when it came down to the wire, and for the last couple of weeks, there was Webb and his Republican opponent, you know, one point apart, weeks on end, and the Greens had 2.5% of the vote. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we always joke about uh, how the Greens, you know, saved Jim Webb. I mean, it's a story you'll never read about, and midnight conversations, and Jim said, I can't even do anything with these guys that handle me and all this, you know. But finally, it's uh, it comes down to be uh, one of our better victories here had to do with a bunch of unknown Christian Greens. And of course, when they when the, when that candidate threw their vote to Jim Webb, they lost one, one and a half percent, but all they needed was that one percent. <laughs> that was enough to take it over I mean, the top. These are stories that you know. Why don't we hear about this in the news? Uh, well, I think it goes it goes back to what you said, Joe. This is uh, uh, this is about the management of what this is about managing what working stiffs get to hear because you know they've maybe got thirty minutes, an hour tops a night over the uh, over dinner uh, with uh, with corporate over-the-air news coming at them. Yep. God knows they might be watching Fox, at, w- at which point you just go, well, Jesus, it's over. Uh, I don't think they watch as much news as everybody says, either. Probably not. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't Sports know Center. that watches Fox News in, uh, roughly around here, unless there's a big thing going on, you know, something big. And I go, well, I wonder how much, I wonder how much of this is smoke and mirrors. Well, I mean, Fox, it, you know, it offers a lot of things that people in my class like but at the same time I was trying to think up and down the streets and down the block there I don't know anybody goes home and watches Fox News at night <laughs> uh, no no you not know, at I'm all. wondering how much, how much smoke and mirrors is going on there well you know we've, we've talked about ending the war Joe and, and, and I've, I've put out there time after time after time 
uh, that, you know, we can have a million people in Washington, D.C. on a Saturday yelling in unison, end the war now, and they're all gone on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And as long as that persists, uh, it doesn't matter if you've got 10 million people there on Saturday. If they're gone on Sunday, it don't matter. And, and, and well, you know, when the uh, women had their big national thing there about a year and a half ago or whatever, it had 250,000 women came to town. You know what the Washington Post had about it? They had a story about the traffic jam it caused. Not surprising. And and the point that I keep trying to make out of this, Joe, is that uh, guys, you know, the, the, the guy who earns his living uh, changing oil down at the Jiffy Lube, might be able, and, and he's, he's, he's politically astute or whatever, he's part of that, 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 uh, that group of Americans that, that, that you so reverence, um, he may be able to show up in D.C. For a, for, for a demonstration well, on a Saturday. I, I, but if he I'm, stays I'm there till maybe. I mean, I live close to D.C. If I went, the first demonstration I ever went to was as soon as I got the heck out of the Navy, I started going to demonstrations against the Vietnam War. And... I don't know if they work anymore down there. I mean, I, you can you could have the whole world turn up in D.C. and it's had so many and it's so immune and it's with its free speech zones and it's all this oh, stuff God, and you yeah. can get a permit if you don't get any news coverage. It doesn't mean much. And there's not going to be any coverage unless they're there Saturday, Sunday, Monday. But again, the dude who changes like oil for a living campaign. They sat there for months on the mall until somebody had to pay attention. But leave, we live in the Mastercard culture now, Joe. Yeah. And if you're not back at work on Monday, you're going to lose the house. Yep. You're going to lose the uh, the, the 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 expensive jew jaws of, of of your existence that somehow uh, define your sense of what you described earlier as, as thinking that you're middle class. Well, it, what it is is a combination mall and gulag. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, I'll tell you, I do believe, and 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 because most people, even you know, I mean, both sides of the, you know, the average Republican's not as different as the average working man as people think. You know, he's he, he misled, and even even the traditional one. You know, but uh, we have a lot more in common than we think. You know, what would really hurt? What's that? Somebody didn't pay taxes for one day. <laughs> well, <laughs> the whole house of cards would come down if there was even two percent of the United States that says no more. I'm not paying any more for any of it. And now that sounds pretty radical, and it sounds like you could never organize it. But it's going to be very interesting how people express their anger when we do hit things like peak oil. And when and and when we're no longer able to do the Walmart shopping because every last decent job is gone from this country, uh, it's it's not going to be a tax revolt. It's going to be a tax necessity. Hey, I heard a terrifying thing from an economist the other day about globalization. I couldn't believe it. He said when Henry Ford invented you know the motor car, he needed his workers as customers to buy. Yeah. So he gave them a raise. So he could sell at least that many, that many thousands of them by the time it was over, and, and millions. He said, and so workers were necessary as consumers. He said the polarization of wealth is now re so far reached the tipping point that the wealthier around the world, I mean, we're, this is not the wealthiest. We don't have the most wealthy people, by the way. Of, 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 I mean, they're all over the planet, and they leverage capital from, from the capital cities and the banking centers of the world constitute enough of a market that you don't really at some point you probably won't need the Walmarts and you won't need the Radio Shacks or anything like that because when you have that much money you know polarized at that end in 5, 10, 15 percent of the world that can pay $300,000 for a car the advantage is you don't have to make as many you don't have to ship it as far you don't have to do as much production that leaves everybody else working darn cheap you know, because they're not even necessary as consumers anymore. And I, I, I work down in a third world country where they sell them water to drink. You know, yeah. and you know, basics of life in many, many ways. You know, and it can come to it in this country. You know, where the, the basics will be what you're struggling for instead of the symbols. Yeah, where you're making it can happen. I mean, I said, how can this be? How can they have? How can a small group of people have so much money that they constitute the entire market, and therefore you don't need the millions to buy anything. And he was showing me, it's a, if all the money is there, that's where you do it. I had no idea. I had no idea that this polarization is global. Oh, when when look when Halliburton packs up bag and baggage and heads for Dubai, 
you know yeah. the fix is in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, uh, uh, nobody ever heard, you know, I mean, the wealthiest men in the world, you know, they have Mexican names, they have Arab names, they have African names, and French and German and all that. And, and they I, all they all I, have I, one I'm thing really in common. I'm aware that the elite, it, this, this thing is not just here, it's everywhere. No, but they all have one thing in common, Joe. They don't give a tinker's damn about the guy who's who's who's, who's busting his ass six, seven days a week at one or two or three jobs. They don't even see the guy. No, he doesn't exist. She doesn't exist to them. Right. Because it's not like they're going to go into a truck stop or go, or, or pull into that Jiffy Lube. They've got they've got a, they've got an entire separate layer of, in, of 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 people who will go and do that for them. Right. Two or three layers. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's the, that's the truth. And 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 we're talking about we're talking there about a servant class. I'll tell you what. I, I wonder. You land in Canada, it's up, and you say. How many of you know what Jiffy Loop, you know, yeah, it's have ever been in one? Yeah, it's, it's the... It's, it's, I'd say John Edwards might be the only one. <laughs> it's, pa- it's Pappy Bush at the grocery store in 1992. Yeah, yeah. What's this bar, barcode scanner thingy? <laughs> My, isn't this curious? Isn't this wonderful? He goes, you know, and I've, I've read something by Paul Krasner was writing about it at the time. He says, is it any wonder the Japs are beating us? <laughs> I don't mean that racially. No, no. I, saying, I, you know, you got a leader who... Doesn't even know what a scanner is, and we're just we're heading into the age where compu- of computer domination of everything, and this is our president. And the guy who's running the country now probably doesn't know what a gallon of gasoline is going for. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, somebody was telling. But me it's on not just him. Offered, there's like a eight thousand gallon storage tank or something. Yeah, there's a bunch of people who don't know what the price of gasoline is in the United States. Most of them are in the Congress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Isn't that the truth? You ever lived around D.C.? Man, it is a an education. Man, I watched they had a then when they built the Rayburn Building. I'm so old I can remember that, and uh, that was really gonna. You know, they really needed a lot lot of expansion. The Senate Office Building was too old and decrepit and all this. So they had all these offices, hundreds of offices, and they had bronze doors, and the bronze doors had eagles, and they had the history of the United States on it, right? And Somebody complained that the louvers at the bottom that let the air in, people might hear the conversation, and they melted down all those bronze doors. <laughs> and that was then. Yeah. And I'm looking at now, up the street, there's a guy that's a multimillionaire because he builds heliports, you know, on private estates out here of big uh, Republican contributors, right? And And all this is paid for with Homeland Security money, because it's supposed to be the continuation of government act. And so they go in and they build them um, long, historic-looking buildings that will sleep 24 people in galley kitchens, pay them $4,000 a month for maintenance, put in special communications, high-speed cables like we don't even have. Well, these guys were the big backers. And, that, and so the continuation of government thing is basically if there was ever a war or a national disaster or a terrorist event, they would they would disperse the government and send them out to these places, and all it was was payback, you know, for the big cat, uh, you know, the big cat contributors. Now the crazy thing about it is, this guy became a millionaire simply by being a contractor, because they had a big meeting in Crystal City, and they mm-hmm. invited all these guys who had been faithful supporters, and they went into the contracting business, and they they're still spending Homeland Security money out there making. Oh, there's a thing. boatload of new millionaires out of uh, out of the, the the bungled Katrina recovery alone. Yeah, well, you see how they paid them back. They made their estates bigger and fancier and richer. Yeah, exactly. And 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 meanwhile, we sit around and we and and you know, I'll be damned. Canned corn's done gone up again. <laughs> I have told people about that, and they go, they're unmoved. And I go, they they said, well, you know, government's all crooked. Well, you... well, we haven't. Have, is, hasn't that been the message uh, out of the Republican Party, Joe, for the last uh, the, the, what forty years? That government. It, well, you know, I saw I saw a quote from Tom Delay in an article today. I mentioned it earlier on the air before our conversation, uh, where he was talking about Newt Gingrich, and uh, he said, "Government is the problem." You know, we we have we have we have been through a history, Joe, where go- government was responsive to the needs of the people, where government was a solution, government was a way out, government was uh, a way up, government was an equalizer, 
and and in the short t- period of time that uh, the people like Grover Norquist have had the public's ear, they've he's somehow he's he's managed and largely because again going back to the origin of this conversation, we have seeded the debate. Uh, Gro- the Grover Norquists of the world have succeeded in telling America, teaching America to hate the government that is that it, that belongs to them. Exactly. Well, you know the thing too is see there is an there is an anti. Um, authority streak in Americans, and we can thank the Scots Irish for that too. They're not the only ones. They carry the gene, you know, when they, they, they marry anything that walked. I mean, their values went everywhere, and God <laughs> love them. I'm glad we have the, the, the surly love of freedom. But the, 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 the dislike of authority is a very, very American thing. It's, it's down there in the bottom of people that you just don't, wouldn't even believe it's there. It's not at the Westchester Country Club, but it's a distrust of authority. And Norquist knew how to use that. And, the, and those Reagan guys, you know, big government, big government. You know, we were going to get government off your back. Communist-like thing, you know. And uh, that, that plays well. And it gets... Uh, and and it's, it's, it's easy, too, Joe, because it gets, uh, it gets absorbed, it gets passed around... And 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 you can and and, it, and you know government is far away and the the news about government's usually not good, and so that's it, it's it's easier to look at oh well government's my, not my pro- government's my problem it's not the fact that I've got a I've got a, a right to work law here that is is making me auction my labor off uh, uh, to uh, the, the, and, and you know in a downward a sleazy downward sp- uh, spiral race to no. the bottom that's well, not the problem it's, power, it's government to do it. yeah. It, 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 Did you see that thing in Harper's about um, they had the nerve to take on the question of what if we became a totalist state? What if the military took over Washington, D.C.? Did you see that issue? No, I didn't. Well, they bought in some great retired Pentagon generals. They bought in some great old retired senators and media people. And they said, well, you know, it's a big, sprawling country. And for most people... If, if tanks went down the street in Washington, D.C. tomorrow and uh, the Pentagon took over, you know, the government, for most people, it would be something that happened on television in D.C. <laughs> now, I know that they were joking a little bit, but that's that's the truth. That's the disconnect. You know what I mean? Yeah. They'd see it, and some people would be outraged, and, of course, we'd be out there. We'd probably be armed by then. <laughs> but uh, the point of it was is that government isn't real until election time to 99% of the people. You know, uh, you and I happen to be particularly vocal and particularly active. But for most people, government is something that happens on television. And it, it's something that happens on television to the point of nausea. Uh, so that by the time by the time election day rolls around, we've had so many thirty second attack ads that we just want it to be over, and we're willing, and we'll, you know, we'll just stay home, and turn the TV off. If it'll just end. Yeah, a fellow too the other day. Uh, I thought it was pretty observant. He, he was a German guy, and he said, "Well, from what I see, I don't think see how anybody would see any direct result of their vote on their lives." <laughs> yeah, I thought that was interesting because he could observe that. He says, "You know, you don't see." things being done for people very directly and obviously by the government like you do in, in, in certain other countries that are more socialized. Uh, you see, a, yeah, it's it's a deliberate attempt, Joe, to keep government from being responsive. Uh, you know, we were preached the sermon about how government is the problem and government can't accomplish anything and it all has to be done by the private sector and government will fail no matter what it does. And bang, Katrina hits. And look, at government failed just like they told us it yeah, would. Yeah, because they live in an isolated consumerhood. Yeah, and because they meant for it to fail. You know, look at the privatization of our military. Oh, I know, I know. The, the, what, 50,000 gun-toting, uh, gun-toting so-called private contractors? You know, come on, Joe, oh, we yeah. know, they're mercenaries, okay? And that's just the ones carrying guns. Right. Not the ones doing a $100 bag of laundry. And a, a, a five-star general can stand there and scream himself blue in the face at one of those mercenaries, and, and the mercenary can thumb his nose at him and tell him to bugger off. Oh, I know. Well, you know, I saw something in Italy. I went to a Communist Party rally in Italy a while back, and because uh, uh, I was working for a magazine where I had to travel, they had international editions, and so my wife and I, in our fifties for the first time, got to go and see the world. You know, uh, to the degree that business travel as an editor would let me do. And so I'm um, there in election time in Italy, and so I went to all three parties. They their elections only last a couple of weeks, and, and so they have these big rallies for each one. And I went to the Communist Party rally, which was a bunch of young people, right, mostly. Mm-hmm. And um, so I got to 
know this guy. When they have a problem, when they, you know, with the street or the house or paying a bill or something, you know what they do? They go down to their party headquarters, whether it's a Democratic Christian party or whatever, and a very direct thing happens. You know, the problem talk gets to solved. The government and their party directly. Now, screwed up as we might think some of those countries are. That just knocked me out. You know, see, I don't think it's I don't think it's screwed up, Joe, that when uh, when the uh, the French bus drivers go on strike, the French school teachers go on strike, and when the school teachers go on strike, you get I mean, all the way down to the local magistracies, the magistrate won't show up. I don't think that's crazy. I don't think that's bad. I think that's a perfectly rational response for working people to an intractable situation. But we've got we've got we've got laws in this country that say that uh, uh, one union sympathy striking uh, in support of another union is a violation of federal law, and the union reps can go to prison for it. I didn't know that. Really? Yes. My God, where? How can solidarity ever be achieved? Uh, that's well, kind, know, that's I, I, kind I, of the what point. What is they walk into the darn party headquarters? It's the same thing in belief. You know, the the two well now three parties. They, uh, that in the small towns, and we don't have very many people down there, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, the office of the party, and you walk in there and you say, you know, my end of town floods every time it rains because they haven't come down there and graded it. And by golly, a grader will get out there. It's, it's Their government is crooked as ours, but a man can walk in and talk to the government. And there's there's so, there's so much to be said for that. You know, we talk about this employees' free choice act. It's a card check agreement, and the uh, the right uh, you know uh, the idea being that uh, if you want to organize a, a workplace, you pass out cards, and if 50 percent plus point oh 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 one say yeah I want to be in the union, you got a union shop. And and the right wing is having an absolute purple polka dotted blue screaming hissy over this. They're having kittens with crocheted tails, and they're screaming that well it's anti democratic. They're taking the secret ballot away from working people. What they're taking away is the ability of the of, of the management to haul the workers in and basically uh, the the what psychologically kneecap them before these uh, 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 dummied up ginned up uh, bogus uh, elections can take place. That's I tried to organize a newspaper in this town years ago when I came back and made another stab at, at living here and trying to make some change. And, um, of course, you know, the owner of the paper's daddy was Harry Floodbert, or his granddaddy was. And the tactics were, were just incredible. The, we would meet, because the reporters were the more over-educated persons, but by God, there were press men down there on the line and said, yep, it's been too long, you get to your 19th year, you're ready to retire, and somehow you get cut loose. And the retirement fund it turns out the owner's children benefit from it. Nobody ever retired from there. This was now made illegal. Anyway, so we're trying to organize a union. They sent guys out to come and copy everybody's license number at night and stand out there and look menacing. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And and this just went on. And, and it on means and something. On and on. And you couldn't believe it. Finally, an atmosphere of terror did prevail. Just through millions of little actions. Then I know how the vote went down. Yep, yep. It wasn't even close. No, because no, and in the end, the more educated reporters voted for it. The blacks voted for it, and the rest of them were scared for their jobs. Well, not too, not too awfully long back, uh, within the last year or so. You remember when the transit workers went on strike in New York City? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the 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 head of that local went to jail over it because the transit workers in New York City, liberal New York City, Joe do not have the right to withhold their labor. Now, when you don't have the right to withhold their uh, with, withhold your labor, uh, we're generally talking about a scenario that happened before 1860 and south of New York City yep. a good bit. But it's yep. the same thing. You still talk about human bondage in a way, uh, a different kind. If you cannot withhold your labor, you're darn right. And meanwhile, you know, I, maybe maybe some people will think we're piling on. Uh, at roughly the same time, Hillary was showing up at the groundbreaking ceremony of the new Goldman Sachs building. Yeah. Uh, where well, millions you, of dollars in corporate like welfare had been doled like out. Getting caught being on the Walmart board. You know? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, uh, my editor edited his books, right? You know, and so she's a big Obama fan and uh, a typical New Yorker, and that's fine. I'm God, we love each other. We have fought and had tears and arguments over getting this book and getting it right and what what the, what what I want to say and what the world doesn't believe or whatever. And I said, look, this guy graduated from Yale, 
I was Harvard. So did his dad. You know, <laughs> this guy's trying to pass for black. Nothing wrong with him. He's got a good heart. He's got all these things that you guys love would like to see. The only thing that would be better is if he was a woman. But the fact of the matter is, he's rich. You know? Yeah. He, he made he he declared nine hundred fifty thousand income last year. You know, he he's a child of diplomats and, and if he can mention a guy in Africa that father to have to go to Harvard, I mean, this stuff you know, that image they they, they believe in this holographic kind of politics or, uh, Yeah, don't well, that. you know, just don't don't show up at Dreamland in Tuscaloosa and expect me to think that no. No, just because you show up at a at a barbecue joint or something like that does not right. make you a man of the people. Right. And I say that to white or black, either one. Well, they're talking about elected to black. I said, man, we first of all, he's going to have to convince blacks he's black. <laughs> all my black friends, they they go, you know, the Democrats they they do they tend to own the black vote at least in areas I've lived, and uh, but we we all sit around and laugh. <laughs> you know, it's like this is a little rich boy. He's still going to do better than any damn Republican candidate that they ever put up. But it's the idea, let's get an ordinary man. What happened to the Jacksonian, you know, tradition? Well, there's there's Dennis Kucinich again, okay? There he is again. Uh, you know, Dennis Kucinich still has his union card, Joe. All right. He pays his dues. Uh, he, uh, you know, there, there, were, there were months on end in his life as a very young man when he lived in a car. And I guess that's the 20th century equivalent of growing up in a log cabin. Uh, That's a nice way to put it. I might have to steal that lick, brother. Uh, well, hey, you know, consider it a gift, okay? Okay. Um, uh, uh, he, he's been involved in government since he was 26 years old. Oh, I know. At, I remember the stories about him when he was mayor. Of the, a big, I remember an article called Dennis the Menacing Mayor of Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, at about to own in the utilities. Yeah, and at the at the age of, to be good. <laughs> at less than thirty, he stood up to the humongous banking interest who held the paper on the city of Cleveland and said, and they said, give us the municipal power and light company, and and you won't go bankrupt. And he said, screw it, bankrupt us. We're hanging on to the power company, and they've still got it. And, and aren't they glad? Yeah, and they're very glad. And yet, if if if, if Dennis Kucinich can get any press, the first time, the first thing you hear usually is the man who bankrupted Cleveland. Oh, I know. That's Jumping G. Josephat, Joe. That, 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 I mean, this is back when the river caught fire. <laughs> you know, I was living in Eugene, Oregon, for a while, and they have a strong old wobbly tradition. Mm-hmm. The old workers of the world, the woodsmen of the world, and workers of the world, and they own their own utility co- companies. Just because that happened a long time ago, and they refused to privatize. And my God, you know your utility bills, all of it together, is thirty bucks a month. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so yeah, but but you know, ob- 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 obviously, it's clearly a failure because it's not it's not participating in the stock market dynamic. No, and, and sorry, and, couldn't and resist the voice. I apologize. Check because they sold some of the juice. <laughs> yeah, you know, we spent a but we spent a bunch of public dollars uh, here in the holler uh, uh, to put in to put in uh, what you know what in the country you know the phrase city water. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And that that thing that thing hadn't dripped out its first few gallons before the thing was put on the block and bought by West Virginia American Water, owned by American Water, owned by a British holding consortium, which is yeah. ultimately owned by a, a, a German outfit with the worst environmental record in all of Germany. They're buying all the water in the world. The world might be 95% water, but only 2.5% of it's fresh water, and only 1% of it flows because the rest, the, the rest of it is frozen. And these guys are so smart. I'm watching it all over Latin America. You know, the, uh, politically, they, they put in their own guys. They let the wells get really dirty and not taken care of. They let them get, become unsafe. And the Crystal Water Company is, uh, it's the devil on hooks. It's everywhere. And pretty soon the truck comes down the street, and a man is spending a quarter of his monthly income to buy fresh water for his baby. And this, ha- this is happening all over the world. Africa, Haiti, the Caribbean, South America. I mean, we, we got and if they get, a if water they, problem if, anyway. And they're, they're, can you imagine the privatization of water? They're working on the privatization of air. Really? I mean, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding. You're not kidding. Uh, the, the, in, in, well, in, in so far as uh, you've got uh, the sweetheart deals that get passed for the coal companies, 
and the power companies allowing them to pollute. And the, I mean, what is what are what are these pollution oh, credits where you yeah, trade from point A to point B if it's not uh, the, the, the privatization of whose air gets polluted? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Exactly. What it, what else is a pollution credit? Now I get you. So. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, Joe, and I don't, I don't know that, uh, I don't know that anybody does. But a good, a, a damn good starting place is getting working folks to realize, you know, to, to, to look at each other and realize they're working folks. I, I go back to the, the grand old tradition of the UMWA, uh, the first uh, fully integrated from the get-go uh, labor union, because everybody was black down in that hole, yeah. and they were black coming out. And so, and so that union was integrated, and, and the first thing that those early, early organizers, uh, uh, God rest her soul, uh, uh, Mary Harris Jones, mm-hmm. uh, the first thing that they tried to teach those, uh, those miners, and it was, it was Hungarians, and it was Italians, and it was uh, uh, southern blacks brought up from the coal fields in Alabama, and it was, uh, it was old Scots-Irish who had had their land stolen from them from the railroad company so that they were forced into indentured servitude in the hole. And the first thing they did was get them together and explain to them, let me, let me make it clear, there's no black people here. There's no hunkies and no dagos. There's no wasps. There's no mix. There's workers. It's like you said, they're all black when they come out of the mine. Yeah. And once they got them to understand that there was only one class, working people, then they began to have a chance. Well, I'll tell you, the last chapter in the book is called The American Hologram. And it's uh, about Americans living in a self-referential media world of uh, where television and media and distraction tells us about gleaming eagles and church spires and our boys in Iraq and all this. And it's almost it, it, the, the level of distraction and saturation makes it really hard to get a message through. But Malcolm X was right about something. He said, first you must educate the people. And I, I, I really believe that any, any permanent change is going to come from informing the people like she did. You get down there, and you've got to get the truth to them, and you're going to have to be somebody they trust or at least speak their language face-to-face, and that's that's what I try to get in the book. You're going to have to be there on the barroom floor, and you're going to have to be downtown. You're going to have to help the guy that's got the plumber's butt crack, that's got the three dislocated disc that lays your carpet, you know? Yeah. You know, if you believe this stuff, you got to do it. Otherwise, you're too damn comfortable. And and have some have some level of identification. You're not you're not better than the guy laying the carpet. No, because I'll tell you, you'll soon be laying it. <laughs> yeah. There's there's starting to be a proletarianization of the co- of the college educated classes because there's really there's a classism there. There's the Ivy League schools, and then there are the the this this lower level that most of us will get our access to, the state university system that turns out the the empire school teachers and all this and teaches them to indoctrinate, you know, working class people, you know, in things that just aren't true. And so, with you know, they... There's they, a reason that a civics get pulled of education. Yeah, there's a reason uh, that civics got pulled from uh, from the high school curriculum long about the time that I was graduating in the early 80s. Uh-huh. Uh huh. If you're if you you know because nobody wanted to take civics. I took my ninth grade civics in summer school after eighth grade and got it out of the way. But mm-hmm. I still had to take it, and I still had to learn a little bit about the structure of government. Mm-hmm. It was gone shortly after I graduated. Is that amazing? Uh, and, and 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 if you can, I mean, if you can take that away, you talk about the self-referential media world. Um, in, uh, in 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 Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit for uh, four fifty one. See, Michael Moore did that to me. Uh, <laughs> Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, <laughs> yeah, Fahrenheit four fifty one. You remember uh, the fireman's wife lives it's been a long time, brother. Yeah, lives in a house where there are giant television screens on all four walls. Oh yeah. yeah. And by virtue of computer communication, the dialogue in the in the T V shows that she watches include her name. Mm-hmm. And she she can't understand why anybody would want to leave that group of people, leave that room, because they had become more real for her than she was herself. She could not be her without the media giving her her own point of reference. And that's that's exactly what I'm talking about in the last chapter. You know, the uh, you won't recognize the matrix when you're in it. Mm-mm. You know, because uh, 
We all get up in the morning and feel the same way in the same world, in the same consensual reality. But the difference is that we didn't give our consent. Exactly. We just agree, okay, this is the way the world works. We don't know why we agree the way. I mean, we don't. they don't have civics class, so the average high school graduate has no idea how the government works. About a quarter of the people don't know the difference between the House and the Senate. Isn't that something? Uh, the, a quarter of the people that voted. <laughs> well, and and then there's the... I mean, by the time you do the math, Joe, the quarter of the people that voted don't know the difference. You know, they might have voted for a guy for the Senate and thought he was going to... It doesn't matter. They're, 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 you know, he's my congressman. Uh, but beyond that, then you do the math of the people who sat at home. So if, say, uh, the 2004 primary here in uh, my county in West Virginia, the primary, the nominating process, the most... Uh, you know, I preach and I preach and I preach that the important election is the primary. Because because by the time you get to the general election, you are then officially in the wrestling match. And you're choosing between the guy in the red trunks with the red mask or the guy in the blue trunks with the blue mask. And one of them's going to win this year, but the thing's rigged and the other one will win next. You know, when the heaviest fundamentalists started loading the primaries and staying so late that everybody wanted to go home? Remember that? Yeah. This all started back with the Gingrich and the Reagan and all that early when they, when they started rolling the machine. Exactly. Are liberals so comfortable and distracted that they can't do that too? Well, then that's the point. This the the 2004 primary in Fayette County, uh, 30% of the registered voters showed up. That means that 15% of the registered voters chose the leadership for this county, uh-huh. and that 15% uh, is actually a subset of uh, uh, an even tinier subset of the entire population of the county and it do- and it happens county by county by county by county and it's uh, and, and it's, it's people it, and you go to the polls and it's routinely a generation that's e- that's that's ahead of yours and ahead of mine mm-hmm. uh these these are these are folks you know, my, my, I said my father passed away in February he would not miss an election mm-hmm. because he had had kamikazes try to kill him in the middle of the south right. pacific and he was by god going to show up uh, yeah. uh, and, and the poll, the poll workers are, are are 65 and 70 and 75 years old. My generation, the 40 somethings, you know, and eh, maybe we'll show up. We're not going to show up for the primary. We're only going to go to the big wrestling match. We're not going right. to go to the one down to right. Little Army. You know, and it's a tele- and for most people, it's a televised popularity contest. It's bad enough that we elected a movie star. Uh, someone once told me, I think you 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 people will eventually elect Mickey Mouse. Well, I think we already have. <laughs> uh, well, I, we, you know I, I mean. think we elected it's Goofy. But, televised yeah. popularity contest. It means that your state is controlling your political consciousness. That hit me. This happened years ago. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, absolutely, that's it. You know, the media is our engagement with the political with political knowledge. Therefore, the result of the process is not going to be through any actual engagement with reality. But rather, you know, the, the signal. It's going to be through engagement with the wrestling match. Yeah, but but look who's wrestling. They're all rich. The poorest guy makes nine hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, and 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 they've got and they've got an agreement. You know, uh, I think I they think do. I think it Joe that not be spoken, but they do. Well, uh, for me, um, the rubber mask came off at Christmas after the two thousand four election when I realized. That uh, now Arnold Schwarzenegger showed up at the Republican National Convention in September of 2004, and in reference to John Kerry, said, "Don't be economic, girly men." Okay. Yeah, yeah. Christmas dinner after the 2004 election, after John Kerry refused to take the forty the forty million dollars that he still had in his war chest and fight and contest the Ohio results. After all that had happened, he and Teresa flew to Sun Valley, Idaho, and sat down and broke bread at Christmas dinner with the man who called him a girly man. They had dinner with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and at that point in time, I felt like I had just peeked behind the temporary curtains that are that are that are erected around the wrestling ring, and I saw them all sitting back there uh, d- 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 drinking gin and tonic Sunny and talking about who was going to win the tag team league match league next week. The Romans. Yeah. And it's to them, it's a sport. 
Only uh, problem is for us, it's a blood sport, Joe. Right. But power is the sport of the rich, you know, and always has been. Why can't they just go back to horse racing? <laughs> I don't know. I wish. I wish. Uh, I don't know. It's enough to make you think we'd be better off with a monarchy sometime. You know, so just wander off and be happy. Raise dogs and race horses. And, well, you know. you know that's it. That, that you know that's me. It's dogs and kids. And uh, uh, when I go down to Belize, my soul is eased for a few months. I get to do something. I get to watch that a that an ordinary man can t- can step out and do something and make a family's life better. Or do you know here everything is so indirect. And, and so complex and full of agencies and laws and taxes and you can't do anything direct and so it gives me a whole lot of energy that this next book is probably going to be about liberation theology but I'm not going to use any religious language and I'm not going to use any political language um, uh, do you know who Will Campbell is? yes okay so I'm going to spend some time with Will Campbell and I'm really looking forward to it because I'm going to, I'm going to talk to some of the people who have been the fighters for labor with our people and some of the people who have been theologians and for those who are listening who don't know Will Campbell you know grew up son of a moonshiner uh, he led those four little black kids up those steps he uh, was a Baptist minister you know born fairly illiterate and ended up being the dean of Harvard Divinity School lives in the log cabin <laughs> lives back there in uh, Juliet Tennessee and does and uh is totally against the religious takeover. Most that Burton's put in half the Baptist churches in America and he was head of the Baptist convention for many years. Next time you drop him a line, see if you, see if you can entice him into a conversation here, I, would I you will, do? I will. You know, um I'm so looking forward to this. Uh people that uh, during the sixties, people that came to hide from the world came to his house, included Martin Luther King, Thomas Merton. And so I'm, what I'm trying to do is I've been I've been talking to people that have real morals, you know, that and regardless of religion, you know, and look at these things about America, about labor, and about uh, I, I think there's some spiritual questions to be asked here, and I don't care what religion you're talking. Well, I think about. I think labor is a spiritual undertaking, Joe. It is. I mean, so, well, so I'm 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 working on working toward that. In the meantime, I'm uh, hoping. You know that uh, that this book, the message goes out, and anybody that buys it, you can be assured, my friend, that the money is going to help some real people. It's uh, not. Well, let me let me let me ask you about the Belize angle, if I may, please. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one, what made it Belize for you, as opposed to Costa Rica or or, or any other uh, any other small country? Two, English speaking. Um, okay, see, that's what I guessed because. I have these, you know, I'm not, and I'm not trying to, you know, get up on the cross or anything, Joe. No, no. But five nights a week for three hours, I'm here behind this microphone, and it seems like I live in this toxic swamp of bad news. And there are times that I talk about just bugging the hell out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 Belize is always where I wind up looking at on my Google Earth program. Yeah, you uh, can't you can't get away from it. It's there too. So, but it's not in control. And poverty is opportunity. It's not opportunity because you go get to be the big white guana, but because you can put food in a baby's mouth. You can you can give someone a way to make a living. You can live where the air is absolutely clear there because of the, the narrowness of it and the way the Caribbean blows. And you can look at communities that are absolutely still intact. Well, is there? Let me let me just ask you. I feel, you know, after this conversation, Joe, I, I hope you'll. For, uh, I hope it's okay for me to say this. I feel like I've known you forever. Uh, this is this is just a, a wonderful exchange. Let me ask you this: a, a place like Belize is is there room for a guy who's dangerous with a hammer and a nail in his hand? <laughs> well, it's pretty interesting because um, I, I live among a minority there, the Garifuna people. Mm-hmm. They were they were a shipload of Nigerian slaves in 1566 that cried, that that wrecked in a storm there, and they went ashore. And they built their own culture. They married the Carib Indians, but an extinct kind that was here when Columbus came, but it's no longer here. But their African culture stayed intact. They're called the World Heritage Culture now, and they're trying to protect it by the U.N. And I had been down there several times. But then when I found these people who live tribally, I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's 
microwaves and TVs and stuff, but, you mm-hmm. know, there's also grass huts, and, and, and most houses are just little board things. You don't have any interior walls because it's hot, man. You're trying to get air to blow through this thing at night. And somehow you don't need your Giorgio Armani tuxedo down there with you, do you? Uh, <laughs> hey, i got to tell you a good George, George Bush story. His ambassador he sent down to Belize City, which is a great rotting old colonial city, you know, where all the races mix and all the cultures. So the first thing the guy does is he has a big formal dinner for the hundred most important Belizeans. Um, I mean, there's ain't any rich people. There are some. There's some rich people. Yeah, that's true. There are. Anyway, only thirty five, and it was uh, you had to wear a coat and tie. Only thirty five people showed up because there were only thirty five coats and ties to be borrowed. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord! I, oh, you're, you're 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 doing a bad thing to me, Joe. You're 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 you're, you're really pouring you're, you're really pouring fuel into the bug out machine. Well, uh, you can't escape though. I mean, their government's corrupt too. Uh, the DEA has a big heavy hand down there. Most people have been very much colonialized. Uh, I fell in love with the Garifuna because they may have been. They're a little bit brainwashed by television, but you know what? We watch Al Jazeera and we watch Cuban stations at night, and we we see different different viewpoints. Well, uh, now I mean, obviously, you know, you're you're wired into the electronic revolution and everything. Uh, yeah, you were you were penning columns from down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what kind, what kind of technological inf- infrastructure is there? I mean, uh, well, uh, there's one internet cafe. This is a village of 1,000 people. Stretched over two miles because see, a, a fishing village would have you know one hut, uh, the boat in front, and off to sea you go, all of you together. Uh, it's it's got well a dozen gringos or whatever there now, and a little bit of tourism, but it's a dirty third world place, you know. That's not where most people want to go yet. And uh, uh, we got about eight cars, four of which are running at any time. The other four uh, of which are for parts. Wherever where you go, if you need to go to get. Uh, prescript, they don't have prescriptions. Uh, my doctor is one Castro put there, and she is good. But if I want to go to the gringo doctor, there's one from Southern California, and she's very good. A doctor's visit is $7 <laughs> by law. <Chimney. laughs> and if I need anything, I have to get on the bus and I have to pay a dollar. It's two Belizean dollars to one American. And ride 37 miles to get anything. But all things being equal, I consider it just about the right level to live in the world. And their community is totally intact. Uh, it operates. I, there's an anthropologist who was born there, and so he explains a lot of things to me. You think people are gossiping, but what it is is communication about who needs food, whose baby needs to do this. And it isn't that primitive. I mean, hell, I can do anything. Anyway, they have an Internet cafe. Uh, they have cable TV because all it takes is a dish and a wire down the middle of the street. So the Belizean government put these in for communications everywhere. So a German guy um, opened an Internet cafe, and I go there because I want to support it. I want to see him. So he has a certain amount of bandwidth. He has 12 computers. Uh, the surf sloshes on your feet because it's also... <laughs> What we call the meat locker, where there's 12 computers in there to keep the salt water, the air, from eating them up. Yeah. And it's a huge thatched hut, maybe 30 feet across, 40 feet across. And in the middle is a bar, open air. <laughs> and you can sit there with your computer if you want, and at a high tide, let the water run across your feet. Or you can lay in a hammock by the sea. My lovely wife is halfway out the door, Joe. <laughs> But, you know, there's a downside. There's I'm a, sure there is. It's, it's not dirt cheap like people think. you got to live like they live. you got to like rice and beans. You've got to like fish. You live like simply so that fish. others may simply live. Huh? Live simply so that others may simply live. Well, I'll tell you, I got down there, and I, when I saw there. And when I saw how they did rice and beans and so on, I said, "Hell, it's southern cooking, man." Well, you're not. You see, you say rice and beans, and you're not. You're not telling me. You're, you're not telling me I'm stepping down the culinary ladder because, it, no, 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 no. That's uh, the. the I, I had rice and beans for lunch today. Pigs' tails. The rich people eat. <laughs> yeah. When you go to, they don't have uh, a frozen food industry or anything like that, but it's getting there fast in, in the cities. Uh, we have what we call the Chinaman store that's bringing too, entirely too many processed foods in. But uh, most people are still too poor to do it. But Now, I want something wrapped in a banana leaf and steamed. Poor. Or this isn't people stumbling around sick. 
No. These are simple people in the sun, uh, children of the sea. Um, how, how, just out of curiosity, um, uh, is there an elderly Garifuna population? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, folks get old there? Yeah. Um, their society, they, they practice two religions. They, uh, there's the Catholic Church, which all the schools there are run by churches uh, because the government never had enough money once they got independence uh, in the early 70s, I think it was, late 60s. Um, the churches run the school. The government funds the school. So they got the Catholic Church, which is big in their society, but then their own religion called, called Dugu, which they bought from Africa. And it's a religion where you're in constant touch with your ancestors for advice. And they have these long thatch temples and... Um, uh, churches, I don't even know. I don't go in there. I'm a white man. I, I respect whatever they do, and uh, and all night drumming. And as it turns out, they tell me that actually speaking in tongues in the Pentecostal church came from the African slaves. I didn't not know surprised. That, but, uh, and it's it's speaking in tongues, communicating with the ancestors. They also a lot of them, even the young people, they, their their culture is very intact because their language is intact. You know, but yeah. they speak perfect English. I mean, and they know what law and order is on television. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> and I'm, at, and I'm, at, well, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing you don't have to lock up the guitar when you walk out the hut. No, definitely not, because your houses are so close together. You wish there was a little more privacy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kids come jump into bed with me at dawn. You know, it's like ah, school's out, and you know, so I'm old, fat, white Uncle Joe, and. Um, you know, we'll go over to the Chinaman store and we'll get a jar of orange juice. You know, um, we got fruit trees in the yard and all this stuff. But, you know, here's a country that raises oranges right in their district. And the poor man can't afford a glass of juice. God almighty. Because the American companies own it. Oh, let's all let's all sing the national anthem, Joe. Uh, that, that, now, see, I, 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 uh, again, you know, I was freezing my butt off and I was... It was that particular uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett tune I was listening to the other day. I read your first article where he sings, "They're freezing up in Buffalo, stuck in their cars, and I'm lying here neath the sun and the stars." Oh, the, the, the name of the tune's "Manana." Yeah, um, yeah. But no, it's it's not all easy. But no, the children get tapeworm. The dogs kill each other in the yard. It's it, the world, man. It's a br it's a brutal place. The world is a brutal place. Yeah, and you know they're they're very peaceful, loving people. Uh, the, you don't see any violence. I mean, you know, there's no violence. When you only got like a thousand people, you don't steal anything from anybody, man. Well, <laughs> you don't dare, because the worst thing that can happen is you'll be shunned by the village. We had a kid, 19 years old, kicked a guy in the knee and took his chicken dinner, and he was shunned by the village. And uh, His life got real he, bad real missing. fast. He slept on my porch for days. He'd come in late at night, lay in the hammock, and get up in the morning before I left. Uh, it was a community. Well... I think all of us, it was very odd because I'm very, I, over the last couple of years I've been welcomed into an extended family and I, I, I feel so strange about being an elder because I'm 60 years old. <laughs> I go, come on, I can't be that damn old. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but I, I am allowed to participate, you know, because, I mean, I help the kids get to school, I help fix dinners and things like that. But when I saw what it meant when, when, when you're excommunicated from that community, it's been sitting there for 200 years or whatever. It's a very, very serious thing. And it holds people together. As it should be. They drift around in the evenings. You'll see a couple of families drifting along, and they'll stop in a house for about 15 minutes at 6 o'clock, say, and the next house, and the next house. Well, that's that's the family that doesn't have anything to eat to me. It's very gracious. And they get something to and eat. And then next week, it might be the house you're sitting at. So these are all things that evolved over a thousand years. You know, these little practices that the anthropologist has shown me, this is the matrix of community. And, it, it, you know, the, the thing that impresses me, Joe, is it sounds like you've taken some of that and you've, you've, you've bothered to wonder, which is, which is a, a, a huge step, you've bothered to wonder if that can be restored here. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know because I I never saw it intact before. I've, I've only seen it once before, and that was down with the Mayan Indians. 
but the language barriers and the cultural barriers were so great I didn't know what I was looking at I was uh, up in the up the Mopan River where they still practice Melpan agriculture you see 500 Mayan huts the smoke coming through the roof they don't do chimneys dogs children you know Melpan corn and I it was too hard to penetrate I knew that what I was seeing there was a living organic community of man but the Garifuna how they speak Garifuna they speak English and they speak uh, a pigeon English and uh so the English part of it enables me to start to get a grasp on how they relate to each other and how they love one another. And like I bought, I, I, I don't have any grandchildren, and so I just love it. When the kids come up there at night, we pop popcorn and watch television. You know? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a dumb thing, but no, the, watch, no, it doesn't. Movies, hell. You're you're reminding me very much, Joe. Uh, I, I had to, there's a uh, we've got a good friend of the program. Uh, a young man by the name of Jeff Biggers um, wrote a wrote a brilliant book uh, that you might I don't know next trip take yeah, take it with you. Uh, the name of the book is The United States of Appalachia. Uh, I think you would find it in, in incredibly gratifying to read. Uh, but he also wrote one recently. Uh, it was a labor of love called In the Sierra Madre. Mm. Uh, and it, it's an experience. Uh, is it the Hispanic version of the Appalachian? It is exactly that. Yep, because I've, I've been down through the San Grey de Cristos and saw the same thing. Uh, and uh, uh, with the with the uh, his uh, uh, sojourns with the Raramuri people, and he describes uh, he describes situations that are that are circumstances that are very similar to what you're describing. Um, the work, you know, communal work parties uh, they make something there called called tesquino. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a corn based beer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll get drunkard lords uh, building fences, roofing, uh, roofing homes, and you know the Tesquino party comes to your house next week and does whatever you need done. God, I love it. God, I love it. That, and, it's not quite that organized there, but but what'll happen is somebody will walk by and see somebody's. Well, like on my on my place, uh, Eldon, the young man that did the work, I I don't have the health anymore. I've got some pretty bad health problems. And coming down the street, the street, the sand road. Would climb up there and help him for a half hour, <laughs> just because hey, guy needs a hand, you know. Yeah, and well, you know, you the, 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 you do see still you still see a good bit of that uh, uh, here in uh, here in West Virginia, here in the hills, and well, it's yeah, one of the and things I think that there's in, a large element here. But 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 one of the things, and it's going to be going on too late, so I'm going to have to get off of here. But well, one yeah, of the things is, it's very hard for an American to get it that they do not value a job. People say the Garifuna are so lazy. The Garifuna don't want a job. They have about a 70% unemployment in our village. There's resorts at each end. The people that work there um, make about $40 a week. Well, a dollar and a quarter an hour, whatever that would come to. Uh, yeah, about a dollar and a quarter an hour. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're trapped. They're slaves. You know, it's a different kind of slavery. But the average, a lot of young men and a lot of older men, they, they were, they've been fishermen all their life. They do not value a job. Well, the white people say, they're so damn lazy. You know? <laughs> they get up every day and they do what it takes to make their world go around. And then they're done. Yeah, right? and, and, and and instead, of, instead of a job, they've got a life. Mango tree, and we sip a little bitters, and they talk about life. I, I, one, one day there, and then I'll shut up, but you, you've got something that's dear to my heart. I was sitting with a bunch of the older people. Uh, there's no age thing there, you know, but I was sitting with them. And I t started telling them about global warming. Now, these are men, these old men, they can sail by the stars. You know, they sailed the big 40-foot dugouts when a man to buy so much as a fish hook had to go to sea, you know, mm -hmm. for a day and a night because there were no roads to the village up until recently. And I started telling them about global warming. And they started crying because they had seen the dead reefs, and they knew that it was a true thing. And I was so goddamn sorry I ever said it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I mean, it, it, you know the, the, I mean? The, 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 there's, a, there's the man who's dying, and there's the man who knows he's dying. Yes, and I should never have opened my stupid gringo mouth about how it's all working, because they knew it was the truth. They have seen it, but they didn't need to hear the explanation. Jesus. You know, so that's how, you know, you go and you pollute an environment. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. And Joe, on that, we'll wrap. Um, I, I, I hope you don't mind the amount of time I've taken from you. Oh this no, no, not at all. This it's, has been a. It's this talking is, to. Yeah, it's, it's talking to Ken. This has been this has been one of the most glorious conversations I've had in doing this, and I've been doing this for since 2003. Well, let's do more. Huh? Let, let's. Is there a capability to do call in? Oh, absolutely. Any we should do that. You know, I mean, this is. Tell your friends and neighbors. I mean, yeah, the, like I said, we're not kidding when we say we, we, we're trying to foster dialogue and discussion here. I think uh, it's a great thing, man. I mean, let's do it. All right. It. You know, there's two or three. I mean, you know, there's a network going on out there, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Yep. It's and there's and then there's a hunger. There is a hunger. Uh, because, you know, at the same time that you and I have been talking, I've been wa- watching a, a small army of people in our chat room who are discussing what we're discussing among themselves. This is, this is interactivity on a level that terrestrial radio and satellite radio can never even dream of approaching. Exactly. There, uh, the, the, and, and, and privately and individually, there are email, uh, as you and I speak, there are emails flying back and forth, people carrying on private message conversations on, uh, uh, the, the, there is more hope for dialogue, and, and I'm not trying to toot my own trumpet, I'm, I'm talking about the medium as I opposed to me. Are. Uh, there's more hope here for an American connectedness yeah. than there is in any amount of, uh, you know, Viacom-owned CBS or GE-owned uh, NBC or Disney-owned ABC. Well, that's what I always say. You know, they may have their great media hologram, but the, but uh, we can build one too. And you are, and I've been told to inform you that you are oh so welcome to drop by the chat room. Oh well. Uh, tell me how. Head on radionetwork.com and just click chat room and register and you're there. Yeah, well, now I might not do it tonight because I've been a little sick lately. But, uh, you know, I'm not a great Internet cruiser and everything, but I, I like straight ahead talk with people in things like the chat rooms and the bulletin boards, you know. Well, I think I think you might, in, you might enjoy this, Joe. No, yeah, no, I don't. I don't bullshit people. I'll do it. Yeah. Anybody can phone me. Uh, people don't believe that I really answer all my own email and I take phone calls. And we, the reason we have people here at our house is it's like-minded people have been coming through here for two years now. Mm-hmm. You know, from the broke back carpet layer with nine bad discs to uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's speechwriter, it's been like a miracle. And it's all the internet. You know, yeah. so anybody can write me at Joe Bajan at JoeBajan.com. My, my apologies on the mispronunciation. Call me. You know, because uh, just because it makes my world better, too, man. And that's that's the same thing that happens for me. I mean, I, I sit here for three hours a night, and, and I guess a lot of people who do what I do do it uh, ego-driven. I'm humbled by this, Joe. Yes, me too. Um, me too. Well, I think something's going on that... You know, I meet a lot of young people, and some of them suspect that something great was going on in the 60s, and they've been told a big lie about what was going on. Something wonderful was afoot, hope. And we did, never doubted that, everything, that we were going to be able to make everything all right. So the big lie has been, oh, well, they were young and they were stupid. Well, what came out of it was everything from the health food movement to all kinds of things. And my own children felt cheated. You know, because in their generation, they felt like nothing happening. This is happening. This is it. Yeah. You know, this this cyber thing, this other architecture of information, architecture of the heart, communication. I know America when I'm seeing it. You know, I've seen one or two in my life, and this this is it. I mean, well, come on, come on back and participate in the miracle anytime you want to, Joe. Uh, I consider you a friend, and I consider an, an honor an honor to have a conversation of this depth and this th- th- this extent and this well, length. It's mutual, man. I'll tell you, I don't look forward to radio things, but uh, but please, anybody, you go ahead. I'm, I answer all my emails. I mean, it takes there's hundreds of them, and if somebody's picking at me, no, I won't. I got that. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, you know, uh, we have an open door, open heart policy here. Well, thank you very kindly, and I wish you the very best and have a wonderful night. Uh, uh, Great strength to you as you go through the book tour, and please stay in touch. Okay. Well, you take care, my friend, and you say hello, and I'll I'll get in that chat room. Probably not right now, though. I'm going to have to go rest a little while. That's fine. Any old time. 
but uh, I will. And drop me an email with with any further information about connecting with people there. Uh, oh, I sure will. I sure will. I'll give you the whole schedule and everything. Uh, okay. All right. You take care. You take care, Joe. Thank you again. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Wow. I feel like I've been doused in in in, in ice cold fresh water, don't you? Uh, that's it for the show. We've got to wrap it up right now. No credits, no nothing. Just one thing. RMR, Gina, it's all for you. <laughs>